So here I have with me today Dr. Martin Keller, who is the director of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the United States. And Martin is here in Australia on a, uh, a visit uh, to the Energy Change Institute, and he's kindly agreed to talk to us today mm -hmm. about a number of the key issues. So, Martin, let me just uh, start off uh, by uh, talking about your role as uh, the director. You obviously see many uh, different uh, new technologies uh, in your laboratories. Uh, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the key technologies that we need yeah. to keep an eye on looking uh, into the future. So, Ken, first of all, let, let me say thanks for hosting me here. I had a Thank wonderful uh, visit here to, to this campus, a tremendous amount of tours and great discussion with a lot of very brilliant scientists. So I'm really enjoying myself here a lot. So, as you mentioned, I think there's a lot of really nice technologies on the horizon. Uh, when, when I look into this, for example, in, in the solar areas, uh, what is the next generation of different solar materials? So the, um, we're having a very large program in, in perovskites, and I know that your mm -hmm. university is also working a lot on, on these new um, molecules, which could completely change the way we're doing solar panels in the future by combining this with new manufacturing technologies, such as roll-to-roll -roll or even spray-on. Um, it's very early in the research, so we still don't know exactly how this will go. But this type of technologies can have the way to revolutionize the way we're looking at solar panels in the future. In wind, as another example, there's a lot of very exciting developments happening where we look into this, how can we even build higher wind towers, which will require a brand new way of making them. And so what we're working on is, can you make them on site? So instead of putting them on railroad cars or big trucks to transport them from the manufacturing place to your site, could you do it on site? And this would el en enable us to go to higher hub heights, which then, at least in the US, would open up wind to all 50 states. Mm -hmm. So overall, I think there's a lot of big innovations coming forward, and I think we need to continue to drive them forward. And so with uh, all these new uh, renewable technologies, as we sort of drive the uh, decarbonization process uh, forward, uh, what do you see as being the key issues as we approach a very large uh, percentage of renewables in the electricity sector? So uh, the, when you go to a deeper penetration of renewables, sooner or later we will hit this that we need storage. I mean, mm -hmm. there is the, the interesting thing is right now within the community, there is this discussion at what level do you need storage when you go to deeper penetration of renewables and it, right now I'm seeing this that it's getting extended out where a couple of years ago people said oh we might need it when you go to 30 40 percent now is it's 50 60 percent mm -hmm. is it even higher it's not completely clear because we are learning also to work with different uh, ways to control and uh, the load in our grid and, and manage this. Mm -hmm. So, but sooner or later, I feel when you go to really deep penetration, that storage will be one of the big, big uh, things we have to get a handle on. And also new control systems to work with the grid. The grid will become bi-directional, right. where we send electrons back and forth. And this is a big change from where we are right now. Right. And so, uh, you know, we can see a decarbonisation pathway to 50, 60, maybe 80 percent. Uh, but what about the last 20 percent? Uh, is that going to be really hard? Will we need to still rely on large thermal generators, whether they're nuclear, coal, gas? And if we do, uh, will we then need uh, some way of offsetting that uh, through uh, uh, growing biomass or through carbon capture and storage or other, other techniques? I think it's the verdict is still out there. So I think a lot of people right now would argue that uh, the last 20% will be very hard. Mm -hmm. But my argument always is, well, it's, it's, when you look at this, how much we have right now, we have even a long way to go to go to 80%. Mm -hmm. So I think the point is, let's approach this level and then we will see beyond that. Um, but right now, the opinion is that the, the last 20% might get hard and very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly having also the, the, the issue about seasonal variations and, and, right. and storage which is another problem but this said what if we go a very different direction that we see that we having our overproduction uh, that we are not saying well we only have uh, exactly the electricity we, we need we might have much more electricity available which we then use the electricity and funnel it into other products mm -hmm. so that's why I say we don't know at this point because if if we seeing the the trend continuing which I think we do in making uh, um, solar and wind even more cheaper, mm -hmm. we might reach this level that we, on purpose, have an overproduction and then taking the electrons and funnel them into different products such as hydrocarbons or 
uh, hydrogen as an example. Right. And so uh, let's say we achieve the 100% uh, decarbonisation of the electricity sector. Mm. Uh, then uh, how can this uh, also feed into the other sectors we need to decarbonise, like uh, transport and uh, industrial processes, these sorts of things? Is yeah. this uh, what you mean by uh, looking at other products? Yeah, because I mean, when you look at the way on, in, in, the, in the energy sector where we're emitting CO2, the electricity generation sector is a very important one. This said, industry and transportation is equally as important. Mm -hmm. And this is sometimes some of these um, areas like uh, long haul transportation, airplanes, ships, uh, heavy duty trucks, it's very hard to imagine that we can electrify them. This means there will be a need for something like long hydrocarbons in the long future. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you get to them in a sustainable way? In, in transportation, in hydrocarbons, uh, will we gain them from, from biomass, which is probably the closest to reality, but even mm -hmm. there we need to do some more research. Could it be that we do synthetic fuels from um, new molecules we, we generate out of electricity, such as hydrogen, and then combine this with CO2 and do fissiotropes to go to uh, hydrocarbons? Mm -hmm. It's not clear how we will solve these issues, but it's very clear we need to decarbonize not only electricity generation, but also transportation and industry, which is a lot of process heat. Right. And so a lot of people might argue that, uh, you know, we have seen pretty much the development of uh, much of the technology we need. We've got solar panels, we've got uh, wind turbines, uh, we have these other storage mechanisms like batteries and pumped hydro. So we're kind of at the point where we can see where these are leading. Uh, so is it true to say then that uh, kind of we're at the point where we don't need to do much more research and development? Or do you think that actually we're still always on the path of R&D and innovation in order to achieve these goals? So my argument is that we're just at the beginning. So when you see we, we're reaching so-called grid parity with some of these technologies, mm -hmm. but this is, it would be a tremendous mistake in my opinion to stop the innovation right now. We are just at the beginning. We continue to have to drive this forward mm -hmm. because, you know, when you, when you look historically, I was make the example on automotive. Um, when we had this, the first cars, which were uh, better than a horse, we didn't stop innovating. Right. We continue to drive this. And now our, our days, these days, our cars are much more than just a, a transportation mechanism from A to B. They are your ent entertainment system. They are having all your heated seats. And very soon we will all have autonomous driving. Right. I would say that in the energy and renewable side, we are just at the Model T. We are now, now reaching this where we have grid parity to a lot of degrees, but I think we will continue to drive this to, to change this. The cost will come further down. I could see in the future that the way we are uh, buying electricity at our homes might be completely changed. Uh, very similar perhaps what you're seeing on, on your cell phones when you originally bought minutes and now you have a service plan. So we have to continue innovation. It would be a tremendous mistake to stop at this level. And indeed, I think that means that there will always be a role for institutions like ours, which are basically uh, fundamental research and development organisations, uh, which have a social licence to uh, achieve these goals. So uh, I think this, uh, this is a very exciting future. And thank you very much yeah. today, Martin Keller, for sharing it with us. Okay. Thank you very much for thank having you. me.